Hello and welcome to the Two Gals and a Mic podcast. I'm your host, Sue Kerber. And on today's show, I'm sitting down with a woman who proclaims to love public speaking and approaches everything in life as an opportunity for growth. Erica Lamberth has worked in media and communications for more than three decades as an anchor, a freelance writer, television producer, and on-air radio personality. Now she's using her skills to help organizations prepare for natural and man-made disasters. Erica, welcome to the show. Sue, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thanks for coming on. You know, you and I met several years ago, both of us working in the crisis communication field. So that seems like a great launching point for this discussion. Let's talk about your crisis communications background. What led you to specialize in emergency preparedness and how do you see yourself making a difference? I was not originally in crisis communications. I've been in communications for a long time, started out in public relations and television, that type of thing, radio. Actually, my ex-husband was an emergency manager and he ran a nonprofit organization. I was actually at the time working at NASA in public affairs, supporting that group. And I asked him one day, what in emergency management can I do that would support what your organization does? And he mentioned a public information officer. I had no idea what that was, but I immediately was intrigued and just made it a goal to help his organization and help him and as a husband and wife grow that organization. And so I started working on what we call credentialing and I just started taking classes and we'd respond to disasters and that experience just led up to me getting into crisis communications. Believe it or not, 11, 12 years old or whatever, my parents actually owned an ambulance company. And I remember my parents teaching me how to be, you know, be like a dispatcher when calls would come in and, and be able to get on the radio and learn all that. So I think my emergency management sort of experience came from way back then. And I just always had an interest in it. And of course, I grew up in the church and we would volunteer and support mission trips and things like that. And I, I think it was just a culminating experience in my life to go into crisis communications. So when you did, and you said that you did this in conjunction with with your husband, did you feel a calling or anything in your gut that kind of propelled you in that way? Or was it more of a curiosity that you were pursuing? It's interesting because at first it was a curiosity and it was purely me wanting to support his mission. But what I found was when we did respond, all of a sudden that that fire in me to be able to help people, it just was sparked. I've always been interested in helping people in time of need. And it just was one of those things where it was heartfelt and I just grew in love with that. It just was something I felt I was led to do. So describe a day in the life of a crisis communication person. I know this is a very loaded question because there really is no playbook for this, but in a way there is when you look at the credentialing and the training, right? They yes. There are certain things that you do with your responding to uh, a natural or man-made disaster. So right. walk us through that. So everybody listening, I could say, no, Sue, you walk us through all of these things because <laughs> Sue, <laughs> Sue comes from a very similar background. I mean, Sue, Sue has such amazing experience coming from the Coast Guard, but, but I would say the public information officer, of course, is the person that communicates on behalf of the organization, whatever organization that is. And the goal is to keep the public informed. That's the whole idea of the title, public information officer. And when things happen, the one thing as someone as a citizen or community person, I want to know what's happening. I want to be able to go to this credible source for my information. So for us, the training starts very basic, how to communicate. Now, my degree is in communication, so some of these things I already knew, and so it was a great transition just already being in communications and transitioning that to crisis communications. So the biggest difference is your audience, I would say, the audience and why you're reporting out. You're reporting out typically because something bad has happened, and you're reassuring your stakeholders that things are under control or you're bringing them back to normalcy as soon as you can. 
If I'm on a response, I'm typically working with a lot of other people and other agencies. And so it's coming together in the beginning of the morning, and it might be 12 to 16 hour days. And we figure out what our objectives are to meet the goals for the entire response that day. And that could mean that we're having a news conference that we need to plan, or we're going to make sure that we get out at least two news releases that day with updated information. We set up a website maybe that people can go to and feel that they can get the latest at any time they'd like to, those types of things. The one thing that I will say that's important as a public information officer is just being aware of, of how your team is doing. So you have this external responsibility of getting this information right to the public, but you also have a responsibility within your team to make sure everybody's doing okay. I remember one time I was on a disaster and it was devastating. People were missing. There was several deaths. They were bringing in 18 wheelers that were actually refrigerator trucks. There were, you know, morgues actually. You're working on behalf of the agencies that are trying to help the community, but then yourself as how is that affecting you in your mental and emotional health? I think that may be a next step for me, Sue. I'm not quite sure where I'm going with that, but I think I have a big interest in just making sure that people working in disaster response have a way to maintain their mental and emotional stability. And that's a real thing, Erica. I'm really glad that she brought that up. I mean, we've talked in previous podcasts about resiliency and about practices, something as simple as a daily routine of mindfulness or meditation or these self-care practices, especially for our military members, our first responders, our healthcare providers who are on the front lines, like these people who are dealing with these crises as you explain them to prevent burnout, but also when you're getting to the point of seeing these things in action, how do you turn that trauma into growth instead of staying in a trauma space? Do you have any practices that you have incorporated into your life, self-care practices to help you navigate that slippery slope? I am a believer. And so I, I'm a believer in God and I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. And so I'm a prayerful person, but for me, it's also a time of reflection. And I try to do the same thing in the evening. It may not be prayer, but it's more of just putting on uh, soft music and having reflection. I recently started back working on my health which is really important because I'm a foodie, Sue. I've got to be honest with you. You know, food and cooking for people is my love language. But then if, you know, if I eat so much food, well, I'm not staying healthy. So I've been mm. going to the gym and taking some classes and things like that, meeting friends. We're becoming gym friends now. And from my experience there, that's helping me relax a lot. How do you maintain accountability when you work in a very dynamic and niche field. I mean, you literally cannot predict what is going to happen from day to day because you can have a crisis emerge overnight or in an unexpected time frame. Do you feel like it's difficult or a challenge to have flexibility or is this something that you thrive on? It's interesting that you mentioned niche and, and you know very well, it is a very niche career. Not everyone can do it. I actually thrive on it. I stay prepared. I consider myself a responder. I may not be a first responder, but still a responder. It could be something like an active shooter situation or natural disasters or oil spills, pipeline breaches, things like that. I would say that someone that is just not ready to up and go and control your emotions doesn't mean you don't have them, but you need to be able to control your emotions and you need to be the calm in chaos. So if you're a person that's pretty unable to manage how your emotions look on your face or the way that you interact with people when things are stressful, this career is probably not for you. That's no joke. I mean, you had mentioned previously in our conversation that you have been in responses where you've been working 16 hour days. And Erica, I remember those days where you know, you're working in the Joint Information Center, you're doing all the things that you've previously described, and then you're maybe getting a couple of hours of sleep and you're right back at it. And if you're working as the public information officer, you're also responsible for all of these people in the Joint Information Center that are working alongside you, um, your subordinates, all of that. So you're having to look out for them, having to look out for your 
mental health and all of the stress that accompanies a crisis. Yes. What's the most challenging response that you've been part of? Do you have a story that you can share with us? I definitely prefer being boots on the ground. I have a tendency to want to be in the mix of everything. With that said, I think I've mentioned, I may have mentioned this story to you before, but this is just one that picks out. And I always share this story because it just is on my heart. Back, I think it was 2011, we were called out as an NGO to support. And at the time, most of the devastation was in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. It was an EF5 tornado that destroyed everything. It was horrible. But the governor of that state flew over the state and actually saw an area devastated called Hackleburg, Alabama. And I remember at country music television at one point said this was the best place to live in America. That's where the Wrangler blue jean plant was. Very small community, rural area, but everybody worked at Wrangler. They had one high school and it was close to graduation within two weeks of graduation. And I'm a Gulf Coast girl. So I grew up around hurricanes. So the closer you get to the coast, the more devastation you see. Tornadoes, very different. You go come around the corner and everything is matchsticks, but then you might drive a little ways and there's one perfectly standing house not touched. It's just a very different feel. There was so much devastation and so much death. It was very sad, but we had FBI missing persons. I was in a trailer next to FBI missing persons in between them and tents set up by the Army National Guard. The Army National Guard had to come in sue because they had to have curfews. Because unfortunately, during times of disaster, especially when you have communities that are flattened or impacted, you have people that are coming in to actually do wrong. And so people would come in and potentially to steal copper wire to resell. I mean, those types of people coming in to see what they could take. Plus, I mean, just the safety part of it too, but there was all these other underlying things that people just don't think about. I worked on different things, like for example, setting up a call center. They had college students coming in from Tuscaloosa that wanted to help, which was great. We real-time trained them of what to say on the phone and how to take notes. But the coolest thing is, is the resilience that you see and that I saw. I saw women coming in that lived there, um, even though their homes were destroyed. I mean, it just brings me to tears when I think about it now, just not of sadness, but just of joy of the impact that something like a phone call or just training people for a call center can make. But I remember Where we are in these tents in this camp I was telling you about, we call it an incident command post. Most of the time, people that are impacted really don't come into that area. They're normally being housed or helped in other areas where food's being brought in, sort of separate from the people that are managing the response. And somehow they had a young man that came in and he came into my trailer. And at the time, I didn't know who he was. I didn't know if he was a responder. But as I talked to him more, He was definitely someone that had been impacted. He was recently married and had a new baby and both him and his his bride and his baby were swept away. And he had come in to the trailer and he didn't really know what trailer it was, but come to find out he felt guilty asking for help because he had lost the people that he loved so close to him. And this was not me professionally, supposedly, but there's such a fine line. But I stood up and kind of went over to him and I asked him if he would let me pray with him. And and we did. And that's really all he needed was just someone to listen to him. I was really excited that he allowed me to pray with him at the time because that's just who I was. And it was in the moment. And that to me was the most memorable response. Eric, I'll tell you what, my guests don't often get me to tear up, but I just am sitting here thinking about these devastated communities and the impact that natural disasters Um, Sometimes man-made disasters can have on humans, communities, wildlife, ecosystems. I mean, there's just so much to it. And you mentioned this word resilience. So it's not all tragedy. I feel like a lot of times there's hope and there's kindness and there's compassion that comes out of the devastation. Do you have any stories that you want to share where you just had like an aha moment? So many, just about every response that I have been on where communities were impacted and I had the opportunity to engage with the people that were evacuated or just had lost everything or just immediately impacted. The resilience is immediate. It's it's like, we're going to rebuild. 
We're going to rebuild. This is our community. After all of you guys, we thank you, even though we appreciate you. After you're gone, this is us. You see them not wanting to sit around and, and feel some sort of emotional, like people sometimes say sorry for themselves. I never see that. I always see where they want to lend a helping hand and they want to put themselves to work. It's just amazing. It, it really makes me just remember what's important in life. It's humbled me and it made me know this is why I'm in this career. I know that if I help put together information that can help them feel better about life will continue and their communities will come back stronger than ever, then I feel like I've done my part. So we talked a lot about helping others and the way that you are doing that in your chosen career. I want to pivot for just a little bit because you're also on a quest to use your communication in a different way. And this way is through public speaking. Tell us about the journey that you are on with public speaking. It's interesting that you use the word pivot because I think during the pandemic when we were all locked down, it was a great time for everyone to start thinking, am I really enjoying what I'm doing? And I, I still was, but I definitely wanted to revisit some of the things that I wanted to do just outside of that. And even though it seems like public speaking aligns right with that, it's a little bit different for me. When I worked for the space program, I also was in the Toastmasters, and I'm not quite sure if everyone has heard of Toastmasters, but it's an international organization, and it's not just for people that want to improve their speaking craft as though wanting to be public speakers, which is what I'm interested in doing, but it could just be where you want to be a better leader, a better coach, be able to just get on your feet and communicate where people can understand your ideas a lot better. I started back with this organization uh, probably maybe 15 years ago. And then there was a lull. I, I dropped out of it when I left the space program and moved into some other areas. So I just recently joined another Toastmasters club. And this year I am determined to compete. My first competition is at the basic club level. And I am competing in what's called an international speech. It's five to seven minutes. And we develop the speech on just about any topic, but the idea is that it should engage the audience. And for me, I think a good speech will be if I am able to get them to hit every emotion. And so in five to seven minutes, it's quite a task. If I'm able to win that one, I can move up to the different levels all the way up to the world competition, which this year is in Las Vegas. And Sue, I got to tell you, I'm confident I plan to be there. Do you draw? On your experiences with all of the things that we've been talking about in this conversation to write these speeches, do you share these stories? I draw on so many things. You can talk about just about anything, but the title of this speech is First and Last Masterclass. And the whole focus of this particular speech is that life is my masterclass. I'll highlight the fact that, you know, I'm starting 2024 and wanting to take these great classes by some of these people that are putting master classes together that are simply amazing, the best in the field. But as I think through my life, I've had some amazing experiences, whether they're good or bad, they've helped me form the person that I, I am. So my life has been a master class of good and bad. And so I'm taking people through a little bit of that. Yeah, that's where I get my inspiration from different things I've experienced. I know that you use your amazing experiences to mentor young adults. In my own experiences, I've heard people say that they could never be a mentor because either they don't feel equipped or they feel like they don't have that wisdom or that background to pour into the next generation. What would you say to that? What are your best words of advice for someone who either wants to be a mentor or who wants to seek out mentorship? I would say, don't stop yourself from thinking that you don't have what it takes. Anyone can be a mentor because you've had life's experiences. People may think, well, I can't really be a mentor because I'm not a person that ended up getting a degree in this or degree in that. That's not what it's about. Mentoring is about encouraging and sharing life's experiences, pulling out the best in other people and knowing that they have a future and helping them set goals, not necessarily telling them how to do something, but encouraging them that they can, maybe putting them in the right direction. Just the fact that someone is interested in being a mentor and something's stopping them, their interest means that they're ready. 
But the biggest thing about me being a mentor is being in that person's corner, being a great listener and giving them the encouragement and to let them know that they can do it, that they can do just about anything they want to do. And as you said before, I think encouraging them as you look at your life as a master class and sharing that with the people to whom you mentor. I think in this way, Erica, you really are blazing a trail for those who are coming up behind you. You've done a whole lot of interesting things. And we've, we've talked about some of those things and clearly you've inspired others to do interesting things and to pursue their passions as well. What does living courageously mean to you? Courageous for me means remembering my mom and all the things that she did. I know you guys can't hear this, but I'm African-American. So that adds another layer of who I am. And I'm saying all that to say my mother and her generation fought a lot of battles, things like I I grew up in a house where I knew that my grandparents and my mother's generation were on board with uh, civil rights and working through that whole situation. And as a woman, I, I feel like that just gave her just the confidence and strength she needed to do things that other people in the family or friends that she knew didn't do. For example, my mother ran for city council. And then I mentioned how my parents owned this ambulance company. Not everybody's going to just start their own business. We see a lot of that now, but back then, not necessarily. And not necessarily in the African-American community. It just depends on who you are. But I got my courage from not only my mother, but my father. Both my parents, I was really blessed to have a household with two parents that encouraged me. So I grew up with parents that were mentors as well. And nowadays, even though they're in heavenly places, I now look at the fact that I'm a mom and I feel as though I need to represent that confidence and that courage so that he can see it in me and that he can move forward knowing that he can accomplish things in life. So I got it from my mom and dad. And now I work to represent it so my son can have an example for his future. I don't want to ever say I wish I would have in my life. I just don't. And if I could just give a word of advice to young people, don't ever stand in fear to where years down the line, you ask yourself, I wonder what would have happened if. And I think that we find this in our professional lives, but also in our personal lives as well. There's a lot of times, at least in my own experience, where I've navigated through things and I've wondered, what in the world is this about? And why do I have to go through this experience or this time or this, as you like to say, learning and growth opportunity? But it could be months down the road, years down the road, whatever that growth opportunity was, was foundational for me being able to do the thing that I was trying to do. Do you have any examples like that? Maybe like a personal example where you've navigated something that didn't make sense and then you had a complete aha moment years later? One of the things that I'm going to share with you personally is that, and it's, it's a big thing for me because I'm such a supporter of it. I am adopted. You would never know it by the family, amazing family that adopted me. I look like everybody in my family. It, it's amazing. And my parents actually told me when I was nine, they felt I was old enough to understand it and just wanted to share and share that if I ever wanted to know more that they would help me. And then that was it. No more discussion about it or anything. I never felt a void. I never felt anything. I was an only child. My, my parents are both in heavenly places and this was not because they were no longer with us. But about four years ago, I decided that I wanted to find out more about my birth parents. And that was mainly for medical reasons. You got to remember as an adopted person, I didn't have a medical history. I did end up finding my birth parents. One was deceased. My birth mother passed away the same year as my mother that raised me. And my birth father, I got a chance to meet him, but he was not well. And he passed away about six months later, but it was good to meet him. But come to find out I'm the oldest of like seven different moms, but the same father, he, my, my sister shared with me, he was somewhat of a rolling stone. It was so interesting. You know, ancestry is interesting, Sue. It is. Ancestry will yeah. say it's a second cousin. 
I meet these people and it's my sister and daughter. The minute she shared with me was a little bit of information that my parents that raised me knew. They knew that they both were in school and very smart. They just couldn't keep me because my records were sealed. I got to be honest with you. I talked to so many people before I got on Ancestry because one of the things I was like, I don't want to meet these people. I'm not interested in that. I just want to know the whole medical thing and I didn't want to be bothered. And my friend told me, well, you don't, you can engage if you want to. You don't have to talk to people if you don't want to. And it ended up just being the right day at the right time that people reached out to me and I decided to make it. And so I have now met family on both sides, the uh, mother and father, maternal, paternal side. Are you glad that that's the way that it ended up working out? I am. It's so interesting because I always thought I was Louisiana French. I grew up that way. I lose the whole gumbo and Zodicos and all of that stuff. And that's in me. That's who I am. That is actually who I am. But honestly, DNA wise, I don't have one drop of French (laughs) at all. I'm actually more like a Meghan Markle. I'm half Scottish and half of African American. So like biologically, it's a 50-50 split. Wow. That nature versus nurture. Yes. Right? That's so well. And then when I first saw it, I, all I saw was like the, the 50%. I mean, I saw like, you know, 48, 47, whatever. Uh, really, really, it's been interesting. And I embrace both sides. I embrace the family that I grew up with. And I embrace my newfound family and they've been amazing on, on both sides. So it's been good. You're talking about embracing the unexpected, which really has to do with change and embracing change. And in your career and clearly in your life, you've seen a lot of both expected and unexpected things. I'm looking for some nuggets of wisdom. So what is your best advice to our listeners for being brave enough to embrace change and walk through it with grace. First of all, I'm definitely that person that writes down all the things that I have gone through and that have come out successful on the other end. And when things are going really horrible, I just remember all of those things. Some people call them remembrance stones, but I just remember those times where things were really hard and then I came out really successful on the other end. My words of wisdom are remember those times. For example, just something as quick as going back to where we all were locked down in 2020 and remember how things were very difficult for a lot of us. It was a great time for introspection and to be able to learn more about yourself and who you are and what you really wanted. I saw so much change and a lot of it was change for the better. Some of it people think not so much. But I've seen so many positive things come out of it and people reinventing themselves. And it's such a great opportunity. And we don't need a lockdown for that, Sue. I would encourage everyone to take time for themselves. Just carve out time and think about what is it that you really want to do? We, you know, life is so short. And just like we mentioned earlier, you don't want to ever say, I wonder what would have happened if. And you don't have to do it all at once. Some people keep waiting for the right time. You know, I'm so glad that you have this podcast. If you had to make sure that everything was perfect, you would have never launched it. If I wanted to wait till everything was perfect, I never would have gotten into crisis communications. I was already in communications. I was already in media. I would have never taken the step to take the courses or to go out on disasters if if I was in fear that I just you know, change was just too much. I just couldn't deal with it. So I just encourage everyone. It's going to be so rewarding when you look back and you you can pat yourself on the back and say, I'm so glad that I said yes. So glad that I said yes. What is it that you want to say yes to? Now you're going to make me cry. <laughs> oh, wow. You know, Sue, I would say that, you know, some people say that, I'm I'm now towards the second half of my life, you know, age-wise. And I would say, I want to say yes to just experiencing everything that is brought to me and an opportunity. I look back and I did say yes a lot, but there are some things, I don't have any regrets, but there are some things that I know I should have said yes to. And now I look forward to saying yes, to be able to experience and just living life to the fullest. There's so much that has happened as far as people losing loved ones and things during the pandemic that now you see how sweet and precious life is. And that's definitely for me. So I plan on saying yes to all the trips 
Yes to more competitions in Toastmasters and yes to making new friends and learning from other people as I go along. Thank you, Erica, for showing us all sides of you and for joining us today to share your insights and your lessons for success as you continue to say yes to all of these amazing things that are happening in your life. We're wishing you the best as you step out and pursue your dream for public speaking and can't wait to see how that shows up in all of the other important work that you are doing. And thank you listeners for tuning in. Be sure to share this podcast with others who may need a little inspiration from these amazing women like Erica. Be sure to tune in again next week for another episode of Two Gals and a Mic.